Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We're pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini series about what to read, watch, play, and play next, because you can always play more. I'm Lori, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Thank you, Lori. I'm not going to censor anyway. Anyway, thank you, Lori. Um, this week, because it is Black History Month, I'm going to share some um, information and items from our collections in the in the historical section, the archives. So, if you've walked downtown in Highland Park um, on Central Avenue, you notice there is a a, black, a bronze plaque in the sidewalk for Julius Julius Rosenwald. Um, Rosenwald is, of course, known for being one of the um, a manager of Sears and helping grow that company. He also lived in Highland Park in the early 20th century. He and his wife and children and grandchildren were very active. And in fact, Rose, Rosewood Beach is at least part of their former estate. Um, in addition to being active locally, civically, Rosenwald um, donated millions and millions of dollars um, to education. And in particular, he wanted to see Black families and Jewish families and white families have equal settings. And um, he opened one of 600 black schools for African-American children and espoused working together. And you say, this is from the 19, and he's, he had, he set up a fund, a self-expiring fund to continue his work. He died in 1832. And um, here is the 1943, 42-44 annual report telling you where the, where the grants were given, where the money was spent. And it just so happens we have this um, this issue and they're kind of rare of the annual report. We also have, and I put it on the, the list for this week, a book by his grandson, Peter Ascoli, who explains the history of Rosenwald. And I think it's um, very enlightening and, and quite well read. Now, in 1832, Rosenwald died. Um, in 1833, after years of Highland Park espousing, let the, they said, the, and this is archaic language, said, let the Hebrews come. When people question, in the 1890s, why are you letting Jews buy land here? And in fact, that's what the press, the, the evangelical, the Baptist leader said, no, you know, we're not having any of this. However, in 1833, this things changed a little bit. Um, very, there was a new, and I took these pictures with my camera phone because these these minis books are too fragile to put on the copier we have or or scan and we have at the library. But so of course, in 1929, there's a huge housing bubble that burst. And from the late 19th century, 1899, in fact, with the annexation of Ravinia, Highland Park grew four times geographically. And there are several new subdivisions, what we've talked about in the past. And there's advertisements. And there's they're now called Sherwood Forest, Ravinia Highlands, um, Crenandado. And there's, there's, they built homes there. And a lot of the buildings stopped in 1929. And in 1833, some of the town leaders formed a committee called the Bound Holders Protection Committee, Protective Committee, ostensibly to protect home values and its protection and to kind of see they can control who's buying and who's coming in. Now, um, the more I looked at this, what I was gonna share, decided I was gonna share this from our collection, the more I realized how little I know about bonds and how it works and the interest and the taxes and the refunds and the foreclosures and covenants and making sure so one person can buy another piece of land, this person can't. And there's another organization they founded as kind of a, a twin organization, as long as they had joint meetings called the Management Agreement. And sadly, after a big, a, a fresh beginning, Highland Park decided these, there's these, this is not a government organization. These were businessmen, and I, I emphasize men except for the woman secretary, who were controlling the purchase and reselling of lots of these many subdivisions that started, that were building started in the 20s and then stopped and, and they were restarting in the 30s when things are getting a little better, especially um, for some of these wealthier builders. And um, they made sure in the Highland Park Gardens, that would be Crenandado initially and um, is kind of the Northwest. And they and to the West again, and again, this I took this with my camera phone because I couldn't use the scanning machine without damaging these minute books. And in the West, which is Ravinia Highlands, which was not part of the original annexation. 
So for many years, these small groups of builders controlled who was buying and selling and who could move in to the growing Highland Park. So I think these minute books are very revealing and I would love to see people come in and researchers use them, people that understand municipal bonds and property and titles much better than um, I do. So I hope people will come and use them. And um, and I was, and I think I shared a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, Highland Park was also in the end, one of the first to address the issues with housing and they passed a fair housing ordinance one year before the Civil Rights Act of 1968 with only one um, alderman who later became mayor objecting. And so they kind of tried to rectify what was going on within these um, small groups of businessmen, con businessmen controlling the lots. And finally, no archives here, I'm gonna stop sharing. Again, I'm going back to something I talked to previously about previously in um, Shelf Isolation, the French series Spiral, which has been going since 2004. And I just watched the last two episodes of the very last season. And it should be coming out on DVD soon as well. And I have to say, it's a great series. It's the first time I ever lost, watched a TV program that long. And um, I really enjoyed it and chapeau. Hello, I'm going to share one book tonight that I finished this week. It is called The House on Vesper Sands by Perak O'Donnell, who's an Irish author, I believe. This book has kind of a gothic flavor and it's set in 1890s London. And our setup is that the girls are disappearing. And at the same time, there are rumors swirling that there are these mysterious people called spiriters who are stealing souls. So investigating all of this, we have a journalist, Octavia Hillingdon. She's very dashing and she rides a bicycle. So of course we love her. And then another set of people, Gideon Bliss, who's a young divinity student from Cambridge, who in an effort to save himself from starving, manages to fall in with Inspector Cutter of the Scotland Yard. So, as I mentioned, there's some business about possible stealing of souls going on. So there is some magic. Um, the magic in the book to me wasn't believable enough to really keep the plot interesting. But what really stole the show in this book is the dynamic between Inspector Cutter and Gideon Bliss. Cutter is the gruff straight shooting detective and Gideon is the loquacious college boy who knows how to spell which turns out to be a very important, he takes all the notes. So read the book for the dynamic between those two. I think that alone is worth it. I'm hoping to see a sequel that's um, Gideon and Inspector Cutter investigating a different mystery. Um, so not a perfect book, still fun. Read it for that relationship. And that's all I have for tonight. Okay, I'm Karen. I have three books this week to talk about. Briefly, each one, I hope. Um, first one is called The Little Book of Life Skills by Aaron Ruddy. The subtitle is Deal with Dinner, Manage Your Email, Make a Graceful Exit, and 152 Other Expert Tricks. And this is a very you know, cute little eye-catching, colorful book. Um, I thought, oh gosh, sounds like something would be a nice gift for a new college graduate, you know, a young adult. But as I read it, I realized there's a lot in here I did not know and it's very useful stuff. It's really nicely laid out. Um, it's got, you know, it's very concise, doesn't tell you a whole lot, just tells you the essentials. The author has actually consulted experts in these different topics. And um, you will start with something like fold a fitted sheet and she'll give you the step-by-step -step instructions and then talk about who the expert was and then the explanation. So like three parts for each of the entries and sometimes there's bonus, like bonus facts. But um, let's see, I had marked, I thought there was something about how to pay your bills or something very, very, you know, sounds very simple, but really it, 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 was, it was more than I expected, you know, more than I expected to learn. And I think I will adopt some of the things she suggests, such as, um, you know, electronic payment, first of all, which I already do. But she says, if you just want to deal with your bills once a month, set up all the like the credit cards and whatever to um, be due or your bills should be due on the same day of the month or close to it and that way you're not dealing with 
you know, payment due on the 5th, the 17th, the 30th, you know, you're not always paying bills. So I thought it would take some, you know, some setup work might, might be worth it. So um, let's see. I thought, yeah, it's not something you would read straight through. I, I don't think, although you could. I thought it was a nice, you know, smallish book to keep in your purse or your tote bag when you go to a place like a post office where you might be waiting in line or a doctor's office where you might be waiting. So anyway, that's that. And um, the next book is called What to Bake and How to Bake It. This is a British book by Jane Hornby. And um, oh, first of all, I should say the, the Little Book of Life Skills is on order. You know, it's not, not at Highland Park yet. This book, this cookbook, What to Bake and How to Bake It is, you know, a few years old, but I, I stumbled on it one day and um, I noticed there's only, it's a big book. It's hard to, you know, it's a large book, not too thick. It has only 50 recipes, it turns out, but um, they all look really good. And I, what, what she does is she sets up each recipe with um, a picture of the ingredients along with the list, you know, in the text along the side. And I thought, oh, that's, that's different, you know, but it really, I thought it was a time saver. And then as she does the step-by-step -step, um, instructions, she's got um, your pictures of like every, every step. And at the, at the end, of course, there's a nice, you know, tempting photograph of the finished product. So a typical recipe is about four pages, but I really thought it was, it was, a good way to do it, you know, it kind of gives you at a glance what you're going to get into. And I tried um, tried one recipe, and it came out really well. It was the um, let's see, I think banana banana chocolate chip walnut bread, something like that. Ah, here it is, chocolate and nut banana bread, and it came out just the way it looked in the book. And I also want to mention this book has these little little ribbon bookmarks bound into it, which are, are nice. You need more than two for this book. I would like to have a lot. So anyhow, let's see. And this is a, a British book. I think I mentioned author was British, but the um, this must be a US edition because it has um, the measurements in cups and um, ounces rather than liters and grams, which is convenient for us. So let's see. Um, and oh, the, the book, yeah, the, the recipe I tried was, you know, had, it was a banana bread. And I thought it was a little unusual because you melted some butter and you mixed it into the mashed bananas, which I'd never remembered doing in another banana bread recipe or several others. And then um, there was some sugar and uh, some maple syrup. And I thought, oh, well, I'll do what it says. You don't taste the maple syrup, but it was just a really good tasting result, like a cake almost. So anyhow, my third book, um, if you wonder about things like that, if you wonder, does this add flavor? Does this add, um, does it make it moist? Does this make it rise? Then I would suggest a book called Kitchen Wise, also on order at Highland Park. It's by Shirley Coraher, who has written other books, very big books. Um, I think in 98, it was Cook Wise. And then in 2008, she came out with Bake Wise. And they were both books to explain sort of the science of cooking and baking. And um, in this, the book, the forward to this book, she talks about her first career being as a um, research biochemist for a large university. And then she and her husband decided to open a boys' school, and suddenly she's having to prepare and serve meals to, you know, 100 plus people. And she did a lot of cookbook research, and she said, you know, she was really disappointed. She tried, you know, good cookbooks, and either the recipes didn't work or the results didn't taste very good. And she got on the phone to some experts at universities and said, what's going on with this? And she, she picked up a lot of hints, which um, made her an expert. And suddenly she was being called upon by um, food companies and people like Julia Child to help them with their you know, cooking problems. But just as an example, um, let's see, there is a part, oh, it's divided up into like types of food basically. In the vegetables and fruits chapter, she talks about um, you know, does cooking boost or bust nutrients in vegetables? And I had no idea. She says, um, some vegetables actually become more nutritious after cooking. And it's something about their cell structure that gets broken down that releases nutrients. And you know, is whatever she does here, whatever she talks about, it's concise and it's not 
she doesn't go on and on about the science, but it does, you know, I think it will stick with me some of these, these new things that I'm learning from this book. So there are also a few recipes in this and each one gives you sort of a, sort of a boxed um, introduction that says what this recipe shows. So I thought it was, you know, it's very useful. You have to maybe be pretty interested in cooking and baking to really, really benefit from it. But that's all I have for this week. Thanks. Hi, I'm Steffi with Interlibrary Loans. Um, so I have three books to talk about this week. And the first one I'm gonna do, I'm gonna follow what Karen was talking about and that's about cooking. So this week I baked something with chocolate in it and it actually is delish, insane, um, insane sweets. And if any of you guys have ever had Carol's cookies, that they sell individually at um, Sunset and things. So I made up something similar to it. It's called the Levian Knockoff Chocolate Chip Cookie. So what you do with these, they were heavenly. Um, they're about the size of a golf ball and then you freeze them. And I've never cooked cookies like this before but you put a, a cookie sheet in the oven upside down and then you put your cookie sheet with your cookies on it on top. And these were really fluffy. They were huge, very, very delicious. And that person I live with that doesn't like chocolate, let's just say he ate a whole one. So they were very, very good. Um, had walnut chocolate chip and um, the very cakey kind of crisp on the side. So that was the one thing that I baked this week. Now on to murder, my favorite subject. The, sec the second book I read was The Girl in the Mirror by Rose Carlisle. For the first 12 days of our lives, we were one person. On the 13th day, we split. As it was, our rupture was imperfect. We might look identical, but we're mirror twins, mirror images of each other. We're the most extreme cases doctors have ever seen. It wasn't the facial differences, but all of my organs are on the wrong side of my body. Inside summer, though, everything was as it should be. Summer was perfect. The narrator of the story is Iris. Iris and Summer Rose are mirror twins. This is a psychological thriller about these twins and how Iris has always been obsessed with Summer Rose. The twinnies come together when Summer Rose calls for Iris's help. Iris has just recently returned from New Zealand after a not su successful marriage and something happened with her work and so she is basically staying at Summer Rose's home while Summer Rose and her husband and young son are in Thailand. The problem that happens is, is that unfortunately her son becomes quite ill and is hospitalized. So they call Iris to help um, with sailing back the family's beloved yacht, the Bathsheba. The Bathsheba is the yacht that both Summer Rose and Iris grew up um, sailing with their father every summer. They're from the Carmichael family, a very wealthy family, but unfortunately their father was not the nicest man. He decided in his will, well first let me go back to this, he had two families. So he divorced Summer Rose and Iris's mother and after he'd had an affair with another lady and had a whole nother family with her. So what ended up happening is, is that um, the father, when he passed away, Rich Carmichael, he decided that he would leave all of his millions of dollars to whichever child has the first grandchild. So Iris and her soon-to-be ex-husband had attempted to do this so that they could get the, the um, inheritance. Didn't work out. So now she's not really concerned about it. Um, but what is going on is that she's decided, huh, I don't have much going on. So why don't I go ahead and I'll go help my sister. So she flies to Thailand. And since she's the best at sailing, she decides that she is going to, um, she's really looking forward to it because she's also, sorry, Bella says hello. Um, she also has decided that, um, maybe things will happen since she's going to be sailing with Summer Rose's husband. She finds him quite attractive and she's always wanted everything that Summer Rose has had. So maybe something will happen on the yacht. 
But when she gets to Thailand, she's in for a bit of a surprise since the husband is the actual um, biological parent of the son in Thailand, in order to stay at the hospital, he has to stay with their son. So in, instead, Summer Rose is going to sell back with her twin, Iris. So Iris is a bit disappointed at the beginning, but Summer Rose is upbeat and very happy and, you know, saying, hey, 20, this is going to be great. It's going to be like old times. So they get on the yacht and they're having dinner and stuff. And Summer Rose does a lot of oversharing. So the story um, does have some pretty graphic parts that um, can be a bit offensive to people. And Summer Rose is sharing some of those things with her twin, Iris. She also informs Iris that she's also expecting. So Iris tries not to be disappointed, but of course she is because this means, of course, Summer Rose that has everything now gets the inheritance. So they decide um, that maybe Summer Rose should, you know, kind of take it easy because she's not really a great sailor. But, um, you know, so they agree that she will sail during the evening when it's a bit calmer and Iris will be in charge during the day. So Iris decides to go to bed after a couple of nights that they've been sailing and tells Summer Rose, you know, wake me up when, you know, when, um, when it's time and that we'll switch shifts. Well, the next thing she knows, it's daylight and Summer Rose hasn't woken her up. So she goes up on deck and she sees that the, the boat, that Summer Rose is not at the wheel. She's not there. She's calling for her. She thinks, oh, well, maybe she put on auto autopilot. So she goes up down below deck to check where she's sleeping to see if she's there. She's not there. So now she's starting to freak out and panic. And she's thinking, oh my gosh, she's fallen overboard. So she's like, I don't know how, I don't know how long I've been sleeping and stuff. So she decides she starts circling back, trying to find her, trying to find her, trying to find her, cannot find her. So finally, after a couple of days, she does what she has to do. And she, you know, thinks, well, my sister is lost. So I'm going to have to go ahead and sail on. Then she gets the idea, you know, my life is pretty crappy. Maybe I'll become Summer Rose and I'll try to fool everyone. You know, we look identical. I just have to act like Summer Rose. So there goes the story. It's Iris pretending to be Summer Rose and trying to stay one step ahead of everyone else from finding out who she really is. The book has lots of twists. And the story is one that readers will be left scratching their heads sometimes. And it has like, you know, you're just kind of like the girl in the mirror. It's a chilling story of identity and what happens when one person um, voluntarily submerges themselves in the life of another person. Someone wanting to be someone else instead of being happy with who they are. I highly recommend the book if you're looking for a pretty fast paced kind of Cookie twisted story, a little bit, um, a lot of drama going on in it and stuff, but it does have lots of twists and turns. And like I said, it is a psychological thriller and it's been great sharing these stories with you. And I look forward to seeing you next week. So for this week, I actually, okay, it's a brand new year. I know it's February, but it's new, right? It's newer. And I wanted to try different things. I know some things don't change, kind of like Tom Brady winning another Super Bowl. I believe it's number seven. I just don't know when it's going to stop. It just keeps going and going. Tom Brady, if you're watching this, which you probably are, give somebody else a chance, okay? But aside from that, um, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to uh, read a genre that I, nor I don't normally read. And I just wanted to get out of my comfort zone and just kind of see you know, I just, you know, I'm in the mood to do that. So I uh, decided to read a book. I haven't read the whole thing yet. I just started it. And it's something that's been recommended to me for a while now. It's called The Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls, Amor Tolls. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I apologize. But um, I wanted to do something different. And I, like I said, it's been recommended to me by a lot of people. And so far, I'm enjoying it. It's about a gentleman in Moscow uh, who uh, is, goes by the name of Count Alexander Rostov and he is deemed an unrepentant, unrepentant aristocrat by a Bolshevik tribunal and he sentenced to house arrest in a, a, in a, a metropole grand hotel across from the Kremlin. So I wanted to kind of look at things that I don't really know much about 
And like I said, I, I don't think I've heard anybody say bad things about the book. So I think it's very telling of, of how it is, but so far so good. I'm enjoying it. And I will let you know how, you know, when it's done, but uh, so far so good. Also, I wanted to recommend a movie. I, you know, I, in my spare time, which is between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m., uh, sometimes uh, I'll watch a movie. I mean, I usually don't, but I wanted to recommend a movie that um, I recently revisited because I, I just, I like this movie a lot, but it's called Magnolia. It came out in 1999 and it star. it's a, it's like an all-star cast. It's Tom Cruise. I mean, I don't know if he's an all-star, but whatever. All, Tom Cruise, you know, some people love him. Some people hate him. He's okay, whatever, but he did a great job in this one. He actually was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor that year. So um, also William H. Macy's in it, Julianne Moore, John C. Riley. But it's like a, a film, it's, a, it's directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. If you guys have seen There Will Be Blood, uh, Phantom Thread, he did those movies. Um, and he's just a really good director. This movie is kind of like a mosaic of a bunch of stories kind of that intertwine and then it ends at, at the end, it all kind of comes together. And it's a drama. I mean, there are some funny moments in it, but it's mostly drama. So there's a little bit of comedy, a little bit of everything in there. And I just thought it was very well made. It is rated R, so everybody's gotta be careful. But um, I, I highly recommend it if you guys haven't seen it or you wanted to see, you wanna start off the new year with a movie that's you maybe not have heard of but it uh, came out in 1999, Paul Thomas Anderson. He's a great director. And I actually recommend, you know, all, all his movies are pretty good. So, you know, it, I, I, think it's, I think it's just a, a great movie overall. So that's what I've been doing this week. And I uh, appreciate you guys listening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have nothing to add because I'm still reading the same book I was reading last week, Gods of the Upper Air by Charles King. Um, so I am going to thank you all for participating and for watching us. And that's it for today, folks. As always, please remember that we are here for you. We're available for comments, questions, or concerns that you may have. Visit our website at hplibrary.org to find the various ways to contact us because the library's hours <clears throat> can change suddenly due to COVID, it's best to contact us via email or chat on our website before coming to the library. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more information about this and the titles we mentioned in the show notes below. Okay, now everyone, um, this is us signing off. <laughs>